So my talk is going to be very much based on field theoretic techniques. So this is more um, similar to axiomatic field theory uh, and less of pure maths. Um, so please feel free to ask any questions at any point about the physics side or the machine learning side, whichever it is. Um, so thank you again for today and good afternoon, everybody. I will start. Um, so as my title suggests, non perturbative and non-Lagrangian, but neural network field theories. Um, so in the very title itself, I'm suggesting something to do with neural networks and field theories, and this is what I'm going to elaborate in the next one hour. So in general, when we think about neural networks, which are used as backbones of machine learning, we don't exactly think about them in terms of field theories. Rather, we think of them as some sort of function built on top of layers of architecture, different parameters, parameter distributions, inputs, connections between nodes and edges, like the diagram here suggests. So it's kind of uncommon to think of neural networks as field theories. However, there has been suggestions that neural network output ensembles, this is already there in machine learning literature, that the output ensembles themselves are functional distributions so if these are functional distributions, one can construct a partition function and study them, treating them like a field theory. And that's where this notion of neural network field theory comes in, which we investigated in the first two papers with Jim Halverson and Keegan Stoner. And we found that indeed you can bring in the usual field theory techniques that we use in particle physics and Feynman diagrams, Wilsonian RG flow, and treat the neural network output ensembles as a real Euclidean field theories. The reason I use the word Euclidean is because the notion of time does not exist in our setup. So we only have special directions. And even though we are using the, the exact mathematics that we use in quantum field theory, everything is on a Euclidean background. Now taking this neural network field theory one step further, we recently probed into the, the part of the neural network field theory where we do not know the Lagrangian and everything is highly non perturbative So it is very difficult to read off attributes of these field theories in neural networks in that kind of a setup. But we found that once you go back to the usual notion of nodes, connections, parameters, the neural networks actually provide a very good setup to study non perturbative non-Lagrangian field theories in terms of these other degrees of freedom given by parameters. So in that sense, we became very curious to see why uh, if we want to treat neural networks as field theories going ahead in the future, then maybe this is the regime where we should focus because it seems like this is somewhere physics has something to gain from neural networks because we can go to this machine learning setup given by parameter distributions and architecture framework where we are actually exploring some of the observables like correlation functions and symmetries that we want to study but the action is unknown, so we cannot study them in field theory. Rather, we have a way to study them using the machine learning approach. So that's the brief summary of my talk. This is based on these two papers and our on ongoing work with Jim, Matt Schwartz at Harvard, Mehmet Demeritus, who is a postdoc at Northeastern, and Keegan Stoner, he recently graduated from Northeastern. So here are the punchlines. As I said, Ensembles of neural network outputs, they behave as field theories on Euclidean background. Here, the neural network output, each of them behave like the field on the Euclidean background. And the inputs, which are real numbers to the neural network, they behave as the spatial directions. So if you have a dimension 10 for each of the inputs to the neural network, essentially your field theory has a spatial direction equals 10 situation. Now the important part is that these field theories, just like the field theories we study in physics, these also have a free field theory limit, and these correspond to the case when the neural networks behave as Gaussian processes. These are related to what we call IID parameter distributions, and I will go to that in a few more minutes. Now deviation from this particular limit where neural networks become Gaussian processes, the corresponding field theories have some in interaction terms. So this is just like in physics, you have a free field theory limit where you just have a Gaussian action 
But away from that, the neural network output distribution can be described in terms of some effective filtering interaction terms when the deviation is small. However, when you are going large at large deviations from this Gaussian process limit, then if this field theoretic description is actually similar to physics, then we should no longer be able to write down EFT interaction terms and actually see the science work. And that actually happens here. If you go quite some distance away from this neural network Gaussian process limit, or let me abbreviate it as NNGP limit, if we go further away from the NNGP limit, then we cannot actually write down the neural network field theory partition function, or we cannot write down an action. Instead, what we do here is we look into the description that parameters and architectures give. So here we have a dual framework that actually exists throughout this field theoretic description, all the limits. But this becomes useful when we are going to this non perturbative limit because this dual framework has its own disadvantage. And this field theoretic description actually lets us win over this disadvantage that parameter framework has. In fact, the number of parameters for a neural network is proportional to a feature that we call as weed. And this NNGP limit is achieved when this weed goes to infinity. In that case, the neural network is described in terms of infinite number of parameters. So it's a highly computationally challenging, computationally complex system. However, in free field theory language, you just have one term in the action, the quadratic term, and that describes everything. That's where the field theoretic description wins. On the other side, once we go to this non perturbative non Lagrangian side of the neural network field theory, that corresponds to the case when the number of parameters is pretty small. So, in this dual framework, you have tractable number of degrees of freedom. Calculations are much easier and they make up for the complexity that we see in the non perturbative non Lagrangian field theory associated with it. So this is the duality in one case. In the field theoretic case, if you go towards NNGP, things simplify. In the parameter case, if you go towards NNGP, things export. However, on the field theoretic side, if you go away from the NNGP, complexity explodes because it becomes non-perturbative. On the other side, in the parameter case, if you go away from the NNGP, things simplify because you have much lesser and lesser number of degrees of freedom. So that's essentially all about in a nutshell, all about neural network field theory, that there is a dual description to this field theory given by the parameters, and the complexity is actually complementary of the field theoretic description. And we take advantage of that to study the symmetries, correlation functions, connected correlation functions, and the partition functions. We don't even need to know the action for the non perturbative non Lagrangian field theory. And this is powerful because in general, when we talk about field theory, we need to know the action to deduce properties such as symmetries, correlators, partition functions, etc. Without knowing the action, it can be challenging. And this is where this duality lets us win over the lack of the knowledge of action. So let me just talk a bit about some related works and the papers that my talk is going to be based on. This is the first paper where Jim and Keegan both were there. Um, so this is based on establishing the connection between neural networks and field theories and Euclidean background. And the second paper, which is again with Jim and Keegan, here we use this dual framework to deduce the symmetries of these field theories, even when we do not know the action. And in the third one, we go one step further and we, want, we wanted to study the connected correlation functions and try to see if we could construct the partition function in terms of some neural network parameter description. So we are talking about the field theory partition function. However, we do not know the interaction terms or the exact uh, structure of the action of the Lagrangian. Instead, what we decided to do was come up with an approximation for the field theory partition function constructed via these parameter descriptions. So that's an alternative to the new neural network field theory partition function that works effectively well. So this is going to appear soon, and there we also explore some aspects of locality of these neural network field theories, but I'm not going to talk about that because that's a whole topic of its own. Pretty. Here are some related works. This is by my advisor, Jim, and then there is a work by Harold, Wenshin, and Usman, um, similar along the lines of neural network field theories. 
And then this is also a kind of establishing a connection between neural networks and field theories, but a different kind of neural network, recurrent neural networks, where they have the notion of training time. So this is different than our approach, where we only find the connection to Euclidean field theories. And then rest of the literature are very much related to the machine learning side, where they are going to explore, uh, rather where they actually explore the, the phenomena of neural network Gaussian process and the fact that you can actually describe the neural network output distributions by some effective correction terms as we go away from this NNGP limit. So because as I heard, most of the people in the audience are mathematicians, let me give a very uh, brief one slide introduction to what, what are exactly neural networks. So practically speaking, Neural networks are backbones of deep learning. However, mathematically speaking, these are functions of inputs and some continuous learnable parameters and discrete hyperparameter n known as weed of the neural network. Schematically, it can be shown by, by different diagrammatic representations with many nodes and edges and their interconnectivity. A particular example that I have taken here that is known as fully connected feed forward neural network. Here each of the nodes are connected to its neighbors on the adjacent sides, complete connections, hence fully connected. Now, if you look at one particular layer, this is called hidden layer. This side, the, the leftmost side is the input. So the data from the input side goes into these layers, gets processed through these layers. At each of the layers, some mathematical function is applied on top of the data coming in. And then finally, at the rightmost side, you have the output imaging. So this is the output of each of these layers. It's generally given by some function acted on the signal coming in from the previous layers. And then there is a sum happening over all the contributions from the previous layers. And on top of that sum, in general, some other mathematical application is applied. So this is a complete computer science related approach to look at this where neural network outputs at the final layer is nothing but a composition of different functions given by the original input and different parameters. These parameters get drawn from different distributions and these distributions change when you train the neural network. So hence they are called learnable parameters. So this is nothing but a math mathematical function on the other side. However, in principle, if you think about many number of draws of these neural network outputs, they are all going to be functions constructed using the same inputs. And if the parameter distributions are kept fixed, then this ensemble of outputs basically becomes a functional distributions given the same input. Now, neural networks in this way provide us functional distributions, if you know the architecture, parameter distributions, etc. So they become tractable functional distributions. And if you ignore the structure here in between, that is if you ignore all the connectivities and the parameters, everything here, then literally you have an output ensemble here which is behaving like a functional distribution and you have a set of inputs over here. And that is very similar to the functional path integral of Feynman path integral that we see in quantum field theory. So in that essence, if you ignore everything inside, just imagine that you are integrating out all the internal degrees of freedom known as neural network parameters, then you are left with nothing but a field theory on this side and you have an input space on this side. So that is the essence of, essence of neural network field theory. Point to note, both the inputs and the outputs are going to be real number. So if one wants to construct something like a fermionic field theory or a notion of time on the side, there are much more um, certainties that need to be addressed. For fermionic field theory, one would need to somehow construct anti-commutation relation between the outputs that emerge here. In general, that can be very difficult. And if you want to uh, assign a time temporal directions on the input layer, then you need to look at uh, the structure and decide which particular direction, sorry, which particular component of inputs should be treated with as time. And if you want to do that, then how the, that differs from the training time. 
So can I quickly interrupt yeah, this sure. question? Uh, Tom, has, yeah. you have a question? Um, yes. So in, in terms of the data on which the neural network is trained, that enters via the action, is that right? Um, could you please repeat the question? Um, so, sorry, I was... I think I misunderstood. If I understand correctly, uh -huh. the... So, so we're going to, we have some neural network like this and we're going to train it on some data. Right. And is the, the data occurs as in the precise form of the action? Is that how it enters? Uh, not quite. So the data is analogous to space time, uh, but actually Euclidean background. So the data is analogous to space. Does this answer your question? So where does it get encoded in this formalism? So the actual encoding part happens in these layers where they're getting acted on by nonlinear functions like tang or um, sine, cosine, many yeah, kind of functions. Absolutely. But in but in the step, sorry, from the statistical perspective. Mm -hmm. So we, I mean, it seems like phi that you mm -hmm. that's occurring in mm -hmm. um, in that path integral formulation mm -hmm. is a function. That's a function from rd in to rd out, isn't it? Yes. So where is the data in that formulation? Thanks. So the rd in is the data, data to the neural network, and the rd out, which is this map from data to output. This is the output space. And phi is actually the neural network output. Phi is the field theory language, and in neural networking, we generally call it as f because it's a, it's generally denoted as a function instead of phi in field theory. So this f and this phi are analogous to each other. The reason I do not put an equal sign here is because then I would be claiming that neural networks actually give us physical field theories, and I'm not claiming that. I'm saying they are mathematical field theories on paper. But the training data uh -huh. what, I see. Is that going to that's going to enter in the form of S or is that just not in? That's a great question. So since we said that there is no notion of time here, if we want to look at how the training data is treated here, we have to take each of the time slice during training. And for each of the time slice, we have to look at the input of the neural network at that particular time slice. That's going to uh -huh. be this one. And yeah. This is going to be the output generated by the neural network in that given time slice. Right, yes. But overall, if we want to look at the trained neural network ensemble during training as a flow, then so far we have not been able to encode that in this field theoretic language. Okay, thanks. Um, is that all? Then I should get going. Yeah, that seems good to me. Okay. Thank you. Um, so here is the outline of my talk. First, I'm going to talk about the free field theory limit of neural network field theories. Then I'm going to talk about the weakly coupled field theory limit briefly. And then non perturbative non Lagrangian field theory limit. And in this particular limit, I'm going to discuss the um, aspects, symmetry, partition function, and cumulants are connected correlators and see how much information we can gain even when the action is unknown. And this is particularly interesting because I'm a physicist by training. So this is going to be more interesting for those with interest in physics. So first, the free field theory situation. So I claimed something about a limit where the neural networks behave like Gaussian processes. So that is this limit that I'm going to talk about. The weak hyperparameter that I talked about, which is given by the number of nodes in each of these layers, layers of nodes, if the number of nodes in the final layer before the output is generated, if that one is made infinitely large, so 
it's not possible in real life computer simulations. It's mathematically possible. Take the limit that you are taking the number of nodes to infinity. Then the neural network outputs for most known architectures become sum over infinite number of independent and identically distributed random variables as long as you are not training. Once you train, this feature that they're independently distributed gets lost. So if you're not training, just initialize neural network ensembles. You have this feature and you are summing over infinite number of them. And statistically, such a sum is a draw from a Gaussian distribution. So the neural network output function, which is not just a random variable, it's actually a function generated using many random variables, itself is going to be a draw from a Gaussian process. So one can study the PDF. It should be in general written in this format where this quantity is related to the two-point function of the neural network architecture by this relation. And the two-point function of the neural network architecture in general can be computed or expressed given the architecture, nonlinearities, parameter distributions. So as long as, once, as long as one knows the neural network architecture, getting the expression for the neural network Gaussian process PDF is tractable. And this looks very similar to the PDF one expects for free field theory on particle physics side. So this was the reason we became very curious to explore this connection more. We looked into the log likelihood, which is the structure, and it reminded us of free field theory, sorry, free scalar field theory. However, free scalar field theory is local. So this term is also local. However, once we go to the limit away from the NNGP on the neural network side, the effective correction terms no longer remain local. So this is where a major divergence from the actual particle physics literature happens, that neural networks give rise to non-local theories in general, whereas in physics, we only see local field theories. So if one makes a comparison between the neural network and a free field theory, generalized free field theory, one should be able to express the correlation function in terms of the log likelihood or action and a partition function for the neural network. So we wanted to write down the correlation functions of the neural network field theory. And we wanted to measure experimentally how much they deviated from the statistical moments of the output ensembles. So this is the deviation that we wanted to measure. This is the correlation function given by free field theory language expressed in terms of Feynman diagrams. And this is the statistical moment calculated after you generate the neural network output many number of times. To do that, we had to make some more connections between this free field theory language and neural network Gaussian process. As I already claimed, the input is equivalent to external space points, but one can also consider a Fourier transformation and make this analogy to momentum space points. The kernel, the two-point function, then behaves like the Feynman propagator. The output behaves like free field without any particle interaction because you have the Gaussian process here. And the log likelihood, as I already claimed, corresponds to the free field theory action. Now, this deviation is measured for three different architectures, which is briefly shown here for a single hidden layer to keep computation, line, computation times within 24 hours. That was the reason we tested with single hidden layer networks. And we ran 100 experiments, each with 10 to the power 5 neural network for calculating this quantity. And we found that, in fact, the neural network Gaussian process sees a 1 over n deviation as you move away from the Gaussian process limit. The two-point function, however, does not show any deviation. So for neural networks, by somehow, by some miracle, even away from the Gaussian process limit, the two-point function stays exact. When I say somehow by some miracle, it's actually very well understood in the parameter space description given by architectures. However, from a field theory point of view, this is pretty uncommon to not expect any non-Gaussian corrections to the two-point function as you go to effective field theory description or non-perturbative description. So there are subtle differences between normal field theories that we see in particle physics literature versus the neural network field theories. Now, looking at the 1 over n scaling for the four-point function and six-point function for the three different architectures, we decided that 
then at least as we are away from the NNGP limit, but stay in close neighborhood, we should be able to write down EFT interaction terms and we should be able to construct some neural network effective filter reaction. Then we can do some phenomenological experiments by neural network simulations and see which interaction terms actually give a good description given a particular architecture. So this is what we tested and we call that those series of experiments weekly couple field theories because we are literally testing the neural network EFT action by running some experiments and then we are writing down this is the corresponding action for the neural network corresponding to the closed Gaussian process limit. So now the dictionary between neural networks and interacting field theories change a little bit. The inputs stay as usual. The kernels are now exact propagators, no longer free propagators. The reason I call it free or exact is because there may be some architecture that we did not encounter, but it might exist out there where the kernel actually receives corrections as you move away from the NNGP limit. So in that case, the field theory corresponding to that neural network architecture will behave like the known field theories in particle physics. That's something open to exploration. Now the neural network outputs are behaving like interacting fields because we already saw there is one of our n suppressed non-Gaussian corrections. The non-Gaussian it is can be described by interaction terms and whatever coefficients we have with non-Gaussian it is, they should be equivalent to coupling strengths. And now the log probability or log likelihood should be the effective action, not the exact action because we actually do not know what the exact action should look like in this close to neural network Gaussian process limit. We can only write down following physics literature, only write down interaction terms and see which interaction terms are going to give us the best science on the neural network side experimentally. So in this way, we made the conjecture that we should be able to write down the original neural network Gaussian process action, which was the quadratic expression, plus some uh, local or non-local interaction terms. The terms written here are very much inspired by physics and these are fully local. However, as I already claimed, that neural network field theories in the interacting case are highly non-local because of the structure given right here at the beginning of this kind of situation where they are receiving contributions from all these neighboring nodes in all of the hidden layers. So the non-locality, the extent of non-locality in the field generated here in the neural network is very high. So for this reason, one has to test all possible local and non-local interaction terms. For example, if one wants to write down the quadratic interaction term, one should write down the no local, bilocal, and all possible non-local quadratic interaction terms. Sorry, quadratic interaction terms. Apologies. Now we wanted to test whether this is just a mathematical conjecture we are making about neural networks close to non-Gaussian process limit or whether this claim that you can introduce EFT interaction terms in the log likelihood actually sensible through experiments. We wanted to claim that this is actually going to show up in experiments. So for that reason, we wanted to study some neural network simulations by generating neural network outputs. We chose mean free distributions by choosing mean free parameters. And for that reason, we were able to ignore the odd point interaction terms or order interaction terms. Now we made some simplifying assumptions here. First was a connection that we noted as we go closer to the neural network Gaussian process limit. We are flowing modes towards the free field theory limit on the field theoretic picture and the non-Gaussian terms of interactions become more and more irrelevant. So we could use the simplicity of the neural network field theory action in the field theoretic picture. Further, if we want to focus on the first two significant interaction terms, which is the quartic and the sextic interaction term, one could assume further using field theory literature in physics that this term kappa should be suppressed with, with respect to lambda. One can also make some claims from the neural network side. One can, in fact, we studied this, one can study the connected correlation functions of the neural networks in the parameter architecture description at low weed. 
and look at the scaling for the four point connected correlator, six point connected correlator, and try to gauge a relative scaling between the different coupling parameters here uh, as a function of the neural network hyperparameter n. And in fact, we found that there is a distinct scaling between independent scaling between each of the connected correlation functions of the neural networks. This is one variant suppressed with respect to lambda as well. So for that reason, if we want to actually write down and test some EFT interaction terms for neural networks, we could say that this would have been the most relevant term and we could essentially ignore this. So then we wrote down mathematically how the neural network endpoint function should look like. This is a generalized expression and we um, formulated this for this interaction term and made predictions for neural network correlators. So we made two kind of predictions. First, we wanted to make some predictions for couplings and using those predictions for couplings, we wanted to test some higher point correlation functions. To make some predictions for couplings, we wanted to study the four point function first in terms of this coupling lambda. We noted that in the three examples we studied, the two point function was exact. So the four point function receives this normalization of two point function where each of the corrections loop corrections to the two point functions are literally absorbed as normalization. And one is left with this expression given by EFT interaction terms for the four point function. And we have kappa as one of our n suppressed with respect to lambda. So this is the leading order non Gaussian term coming from EFT. So noticing the difference between the experimental four point function calculated as statistical moment and the Gaussian four point function, which can just be calculated using Weak's theorem and the expression for the kernel in the Indian GP limit. And by calculating this on Mathematica as a analytic expression given here, one can obtain an expression for lambda, this coupling. In general, this should come out as a function of the input points. And if the fluctuations between different components, this will come out as a tensor. If the tensor components have very small fluctuations, one can treat this as a constant. If not, then this is no longer a coupling constant, although I wrote it as a coupling constant. This is no longer in general a coupling constant, rather a coupling function. Because as I said, these field theories are not local away from the Gaussian process limit. So we estimate this coupling function, a coupling parameter lambda, then for simplicity, just because we are doing some experiments to check here whether this field theory description works or not. That was, all, that was only the reason that we decided we will average over the components if the fluctuations are small and treat that averaged estimate of the coupling as a coupling constant. And we will use that to predict the leading order correction to the six point function. So this is the field theoretic description from physics for the six point function. Now, if we make the corrections to the two point function, then we get this as the final expression for the six point function. And these are order kappa, so these are suppressed, and this is the leading order correction term given in terms of lambda. And we already estimated lambda using the four point experiment. And here is the advantage of using Feynman diagrams and field theoretic language over using neural network machine learning language. You have to write down a horrendous amount of text and mathematical expressions if you want to describe everything in terms of neural networks as parameters architecture. However, if we just borrow the features of Feynman diagrams from physics, the neural networks are going to be literally symbolic expressions as in here. So we are now going to add this as the non-Gaussian correction term to the Gaussian process six point function, which is given by Weeks theorem again. And we are going to test whether this goes close to the actual experimental statistical moment estimate. So this is the original NNGP six point function. And we added this order lambda contribution. And overall, this is normalized by the statistical moment here. And we saw that this went up very close to one, which suggested that up to order lambda correction, the six point function is very well described by the EFT interaction term. 
Um, this is just one example of one particular architecture, but we actually ran this experiment over all the three architectures. Um, I just wanted to demonstrate this and claim that up to this weakly coupled field theoretic description of neural networks, things work pretty well. And this made us more curious that what happens when we go to the non perturbative side of neural network field theories? Because we already know we have this dual framework given by architecture and parameters. However, if you think about field theories in general, non perturbative field theories are a nightmare. You have to, in general, treat them by numerical simulations, Monte Carlo methods, various other kind of techniques, but to get analytic expressions is in general very hard for non perturbative field theories, especially when the action is unknown. So this is where we wanted to take advantage of the dual framework of neural network field theories. Uh, of course, we had some bigger goals for physics, like what if we can come up with local field theories in the future? What if we can go to Minkowski and space time by analytic continuation of the input space? All these were on our mind. So these were the bigger motivations for exploring how much neural network architectures can contribute to non perturbative non-Lagrangian field theories. So that is the final part of my talk, followed by um, different um, attributes like symmetries, connected correlation functions, and partition functions that we explore in this particular section of neural network field theories. So um, as I already mentioned, IID assumptions are the reason that we have neural network Gaussian process, which behaves as free field theories. And small violations, of this IID assumption breaks this central limit theorem, which governs the Gaussian process assumption. And we can write down the effective field theory interaction terms. We can actually see a very good fit to actual neural network experiments. However, a very large deviation from this IID assumption and central limit theorem um, establishment, large can be in two directions. One can break IID by turning on parameter correlations, making the parameter correlations very large. And that's what happens when we have neural network training dynamics, because the training dynamics correlates all the parameter distributions. In general, it becomes very hard to write down the analytic forms of the parameter distributions. That's very highly correlated parameter description for the neural network and corresponds to a very non perturbative corresponding field theory. On the other side, one can go to very small width architecture wise, keep the parameter distributions as they are. However, just lower the width more and more. So now you are in a very small width regime. And if you want to treat the neural network field theory in that regime, you're in a highly non Gaussian process regime. So one may ask that if you're talking about a neural network field theory, which has very uh, small width, physically, does it correspond to only a patch of space time and the field is only defined over there? Yes, one may actually think of it as a field theory defined only on a patch of Euclidean space time and not over the full space time. However, I will not go into that. Um, so the point is in these two particular cases or various combinations of these two cases will lead to non perturbative non Lagrangian field theories. In fact, this is interesting because then one can try different kind of neural network architectures and hopefully soon in the future we will be able to generate a neural network field theory, which in the free limit will match the known field theories, let's say scalar field theory on Euclidean background or fermionic field theory on Euclidean background. And as we go away from that, as we go to the non perturbative regime, in that case, we should be able to study some of the properties. So in, in this sense, we should be able to engineer, construct the non perturbative regime of some of the known field theories just through uh, tuning the neural network architectures properly. And that that's not something that one generally thinks of when we talk about field theories in particle physics literature. We just have the field theories, but there is no way to um, tune some parameters and come up with the field theories of desire. However, neural networks kind of provide us, kind of because we have not yet done it, but in principle it is possible. So uh, in theory, neural networks provide us with this framework to generate field theories that we want. Um, so here I'm going to change the notation. As you can see, I'm going to treat the output function as a field and describe them in terms of the parameter space description, where this is what I call neuron. 
This is literally the contribution of each of the nodes of the neural network in the final layer. So this neuron literally captures everything that happens until the final layer, including the contribution of the parameters, learnable parameters theta, and it shows up as a function of the original input x. However, this is not treated as a field. This is just treated as a mathematical function. And a composition of n number of this mathematical functions is the neural network output, which can be treated as a field here. So one can think of this side of the picture as the field theory side of the picture, whereas this side of the picture as the parameter space side. So on this side, the action would be in general unknown and we will have a non perturbative field theory. However, on this side, we will know everything. Parameter space. So we know the parameter distributions. We know the architecture. We know the nonlinearities. So we know everything that composes this functions and the final expression for this function. So computations can be done in this side of the equality, even when we do not know anything on this side. For example, I wrote down the expression for the connect the, the correlator for correlators or uh, correlation functions in these two different frameworks. In the first case, one needs to know the action. If you do not know the action, then you cannot obtain uh, the expressions for the correlation functions. On the other side, if you want to study the correlation functions, if you know the parameter distributions, um, and if you know how these neuron contributions look like, you can express it as a correlation function. And depending on the integrability here, you can obtain closed form expressions as well. So then at least here we have a mathematical expression on this side. We can study that expression and see how much information we can pull out of this parameter space and how much predictions we can make for these non perturbative field theories. That's going to be the crux of my talk for the rest of the duration, rest 15 minutes. So I'm going to talk about symmetry, connected correlators or cumulants. They're two terms for the same thing and partition functions via this 12 framework that I just described here. First, I'm going to talk about symmetries and uh, because this is a mathematics seminar, please feel free to interrupt me if you have any questions about this particular um, subsection. So in general, when we talk about symmetries of neural networks, there is a notion of invariance as we study in physics or mathematics, and there is also the notion of equivariance. So for day to day applications of machine learning and neural networks, people are generally interested in equivariance. However, that's pretty um, application based and what is not so well studied is the invariance of the output distributions because it has less practical applications in recognizing the pictures of cats and dogs. We wanted to study the symmetries, the symmetry invariances of the neural network actions, especially in the case when we do not know the action using the duality. So we wanted to um, focus on this aspect, the symmetry invariance. We found that we can read out the symmetries as long as we know the symmetries of the parameter distributions. This is a very nice feature that neural networks have. So what happens is in general, one can show that any symmetry transformations of the outputs and the correlation functions gets absorbed into the symmetry transformations of the parameters that make up the output or the correlation functions. And in general, the symmetries of the correlation functions show up as symmetries of the action in the field theoretic description. So if we know the symmetry invariances of the parameter description, then that literally translates into the symmetries of the action, even when we do not know the action. So this way, knowing the symmetries via the symmetries of the parameters can let us constrain the action when we do not know it. So a brief overview of this. First, the neural network Gaussian process. Because this is a Gaussian process, the whole neural network output distribution can be described by the two-point function and the higher order correlation function constructed using weak theorem from the two-point function. So if we know the symmetries of the two-point function, we know the symmetries of the full dis distribution in this limit, in NGP limit. For example, if one chooses mean-free SOD invariant parameter distributions, such as here, 
then it is going to show up as SOD. This capital D corresponds to the output space dimension. This is again a change of notation from before. This is going to show up as the symmetry of the two point function or kernel. And this will give us all correlation functions that are SO output dimension D invariant. And we know that that only can happen if the action itself is SOD invariant. So literally here, this symmetry of the parameter distribution translate, translates into the symmetry of the action. Some more uh, details of this mathematics. The two-point function transforms with a one delta function, and the delta function would be invariant under rotation proof. And the higher point correlation functions, I'm talking about mean free, so only the even point correlation functions are non-vanishing, and each of them will have products of delta functions, and each of the delta functions will remain invariant under rotation proof. So overall, all these correlation functions are going to be invariant. Now, this was all good when we are talking about the free field theory limit, which is the Gaussian process limit, and there are no non-Gaussian corrections to the correlation functions, and we could only study the invariance of this particular expression. However, things are not so easy because once we move away from the non-Gaussian, sorry, once we move away from the Gaussian process limit, there would be correction terms if we are looking at the field theoretic picture. And if we do not know the exact action, whether it is EFT description, whether it is non-perturbative regime, as long as we do not know the exact action, we do not know the full symmetry of this correlation function. So that's going to be a trouble looking at it from the field theoretic perspective. And this is where we wanted to take advantage of the parameter space. We wanted to write down the expression of the correlation functions in this format, and then wanted to study the symmetries of these expressions. We wanted to see what happens when you transform each of these neurons by some symmetry transformation. If there is some constraint applied to the measure or the probability distribution function such that this overall expression remains invariant, then that will give us invariant correlation function and in term invariant actions. That was essentially the goal. So to summarize the goal, the action would be invariant as long as the transformations will leave us with correlators that are invariant. And we are going to check this invariance by absorbing the transformations of the correlators into transformations of the parameters, as I just discussed here in this part. We are going to assume that for neural networks, the measures of the neurons are going to be invariant, and thus any transformation of the neurons would have to impact the transformation of the PDF and altogether these transformations should cancel each other out. And this is what I mean that if you transform each of the output functions, if I am using two notations interchangeably, if or phi, both for neural network, my apologies if this is con confusing. So this if here is actually referring to the neuron contributions that are written down as mathematical functions and has uh, sorry, this F here is actually referring to the field theory description similar to phi because I have written down the action. So we are going to transform each of these. And as long as we have the action invariant, we are going to have a correlation function that's invariant under the transformation on the action uh, on, uh, on the outputs. Um, in particular, the symmetries of the neural network output layers are related to the symmetries of the internal, uh, the internal symmetries as we know in field theoretic description, and the symmetries of the neural network input layers are related to the symmetries of the space time as we know in field theory. And we explored whether this prediction is true or not, whether we can actually read off the symmetries of the action just by reading the symmetries of the parameter distributions or not. Um, and for that, we took this particular two examples. One was a symmetry transformation applied on the final hidden layer of a fully connected feed forward network. And another one was a symmetry transformation applied to the first um, linear layer of a fully connected feed forward network. So in this particular case, we are going to choose parameters that are drawn from SOT invariant distributions. And if our predictions are correct, this should lead us to field theory where each of the um, outputs and each of the correlation functions are actually SOT invariant. And we found that, that that's actually true. On the other hand, if we wanted to act on 
the inputs to the neural networks with a rotation group. This D is the input dimension. Then um, we wanted to ensure that this transformation over here should lead us to a field distribution that's actually invariant on the spatial rotations. And we found that one can construct that as well, as long as we are absorbing this rotation in the parameters here, which is the first linear layer parameters. So this prediction showed up to be correct. So in this way, even though we do not know the action, we could constrain the symmetries of the action just by choosing appropriate parameter distribution. So that was one step closer to engineering the field theories that we want with particular symmetries. But then there were other questions. So we have only read about the symmetries of the field theories when we do not know the action. How about other properties? How much more can we constrain? And that's going to be the rest of my talk. First, I'm going to talk about the connected correlators. So I talked about the correlation functions over here, but they do not show up as connected correlators of the field space language. We wanted to have a description for the connected correlation functions for the field theoretic language. I've switched back to phi for the neural network as a field and neurons as H. So there may be two cases. We might have finite weight or we might have parameter correlations. These are the parameter correlation generators, sets of independent coefficients, maybe anything. And in general, when this alpha or A, this is a typo, if this is zero, then we have independent IIT parameter distributions. However, if this is non zero, then we have correlated parameter distributions. So we wanted to have an expression for the cumulants or connected correlators in the field theory language given by the parameter description. And we found one, which is the cumulant generating functional. Here, the cumulant generating functional is given by the cumulants in the in this field space language, these are the connected correlators of the field phi. And this is actually equal to this mathematical expression given over the neurons and their parameter distributions. So as long as one can evaluate that subject to the integrability of this, one can obtain expressions for the cumulants in the field space. So even though we do not know the action, we might be able to get expressions for the cumulants as long as we can integrate this also take the log. So if we have just finite weight, but no parameter correlation, then things simplify a lot, and we have a one-to-one -one correspondence between the cumulants of the field phi and each cumulant of the neuron HI. So this is the cumulant of a single neuron. That's how much it simplifies. It's not even the, the cumulant of all neurons taken together. Rather, a single neuron cumulant corresponds to the cumulant of the corresponding output field phi, as long as we have the IID assumption. On the other hand, if we have finite weight, but the parameters get correlated, then each of the cumulants of the resulting field will receive contributions from all the neurons and all of their cumulants. So things become pretty much complicated. Nonetheless, one can still get the expressions. In other words, if we know the parameter distributions numerically, then one can obtain the numerical values for the cumulants of the field theoretic description. And we can then use them to uh, make further predictions for the field theory side where the action is unknown. And lastly, using the knowledge of cumulants, we wanted to make predictions for the probability distribution functions and partition functions. We noted that the CGF is related to the partition functions, partition function by this log. And the partition function is related to the PDF by this relation. So if we do an inverse Fourier transformation on the cumulant generating functional, then we should be able to write down the PDF of the field theory where the action is unknown in terms of cumulants given by parameter space language such as here. So we take advantage of that and we tested whether this is correct or not by setting the infinite width limit with no parameter distribution, sorry, no parameter correlation. So that's the central limit theorem working limit where we should have the Gaussian process. And we find that in fact, the PDF is equivalent to the Gaussian process PDF where this is the inverse of the two point function. 
So this told us that this expression that we get for the non perturbative field theory is actually correct. Then using this, we further constructed the partition function. So this is for the partition function for the field when the parameter correlations are non zero. This is given in terms of sum of two quantities. First is the no parameter correlation partition function, and the next one is a contribution due to the parameter correlation. So if we, one considers the training of the neural network when parameters become very highly correlated and it corresponds to a non perturbative field theory in the neural network at each of the time slice, then in general it would be very difficult to write down um, the action for that field theory, but one can still construct the partition function by obtaining uh, the numerical values for the cumulants in the parameter space, then constructing the cumulant generating function and using that, then constructing the PDF using that, and finally constructing the partition function using that. So this is a reverse engineering of some of the quantities in the neural network field theory in the non perturbative non-Lagrangian limit using this 12 framework given by the parameters. So this is just a definition. Um, and finally, to summarize, we already discussed that neural network output distributions have dual pictures. One is given by a field space, another is given by a parameter space. Now the field space descriptions are very interesting because when we have NNGP, it leads us to free field theories. When we have small violations of the central limit theorem, it leads us to weakly coupled field theories in neural networks. And then as we have large violations, it takes us to non-perturbative, non-Lagrangian field theories. And a very interesting point to note here that one might have more than one architectures that have the same NNGP limit. However, as you move away from the NNGP limit, you need different interaction terms to describe the weakly coupled field theories are completely different behaviors in the non perturbative non-Lagrangian regime. So in this way, one may have a class of neural networks where you actually construct different non perturbative non-Lagrangian field theories, but have the same Gaussian process limit. So that, that's something that's very interesting and we generally do not see in particle physics side. So these are aspects of neural network field theories that are very nice uh, and open to uh, exploration in the future. And then a very important point of why we should even care about these field theories that are arising in the neural networks. It is because as long as one can find architectures where the neural network output correlation functions satisfy the Osterwalder Schrader axioms, reflection positivity constraint is satisfied, then one can make the assumption that you can take one of the directions in the neural network input space and we rotate it to um, a temporal direction. So then even though the neural network that you simulate on the computer is going to give you a Euclidean field theory, you should be able to claim that there exists a corresponding field theory on the Minkowski background. So one can still study the neural network field theory properties and then make the analytic continuation um, to the Minkowski background and obtain the corresponding properties for the corresponding quantum field theory. So in that way, those neural network architectures would correspond to quantum field theories. And um, by choosing proper architectures, one would be able to construct the quantum field theories of desire. So that's one of our future goals, and that's one of the major motivations for the whole program here. Then one advantage of the field theoretic language is as we go towards the GP limit, the complexity explodes in the parameter space, but we have lesser and lesser non-Gaussian coefficients because we are flowing towards pre-field theory limit. On the other hand, as we move away from the pre-field theory limit, we have non-perturbative behaviors. Action in general is unknown. However, we have lesser parameters. So we can actually study the properties of the non-perturbative field theory in this particular dual framework and obtain uh, information and symmetries, cumulants, and partition functions. Um, so one of our ongoing works right now is about um, constructing local field theories using neural networks because that's one of the challenges uh, neural networks give us. In general, the output distributions are highly non-local or highly local. And to controllably construct a theory that has local interaction terms, however, derivative terms like the quadratic order or the higher order derivative terms, that's something that we are aiming at right now. Thank you so much. I will take questions.